He was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire. Secret and self-contained, and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shrivelled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke as shrewdly in his grating voice. A frosty rime was on his head and on his eyebrows and his wiry chin. He carried his own low temperature always about with him. He iced his office in the dog days and didn't thaw it one degree at Christmas. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say with gladsome looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was o'clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such or such a place of Scrooge. Even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him, and when they saw him coming on would tug their owners into doorways and up courts, and then would wag their tails as though they said, No eye at all is better than an evil eye, dark master. I love Charles Dickens' novel A Christmas Carol, or to give it its full title, A Christmas Carol in prose being a ghost story of Christmas. It is a wonderful tale, a story of redemption, transformation and forgiveness. Dickens knew his audience well, and the character of Ebenezer Scrooge, a reformed miser, was particularly appealing to Victorian people, as they already had a fascination and curiosity with eccentricity. England was good, it seems, at producing eccentrics, uh, perhaps it still is, particularly penny-pinching misers and misanthropes, and English people enjoyed reading all about them. Biographies were published of a number of misers, and they sold as well as Dickens' own novels. So over the next couple of weeks as we approach Christmas, I'm going to share with you the stories of a few of these miserly characters of Old England, all men, some of whom were undoubtedly, at least in part, the model for Scrooge, who seems to be the distillation of the more extreme traits within a number of these individuals. I'm going to start with the most mild-mannered of all of them, and as we get closer to Christmas... I might end up telling you about the most odious, who was a truly horrible individual. Now, if you want to read about another couple of misers, I have published an article in this month's Antiquary magazine about two, an uncle and nephew, Sir Harvey and John Elwes, whose miserliness was directed primarily inwards into a curious sort of self-mortification. Copies of this issue are available on the website, and this issue also has articles on other suitably edifying seasonal curiosities. Today's miser is a man called James Wood, who died in 1836 at the age of 80, seven years before Dickens published A Christmas Carol. He was universally known to people as Jemmy Wood. Jemmy being a nickname a bit like Jimmy for someone called James but it was also the name of a burglar's crowbar, which somehow seems appropriate given his natural ability to part people from their money. Jemmy Wood, the miser of Gloucester, was so well known for his curious ways in the 19th century that in the 1840s and 50s, the potteries of Stoke-on-Trent were churning out portrait figures of him. If you so wanted, you could have your very own little miser to stand upon and ornament your mantelpiece. Jemmy Wood was by no means as misanthropic and unpleasant as Scrooge, but he was squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching and covetous. And that, with being very rich indeed, was a combination that appealed to people's sense of curiosity. And people would actually travel to Gloucester just to see him in the flesh, not that he would know that he was as rich as Croesus from his outward appearance. Jemmy Wood was born in October of 1750 in the house he actually died in, which was situated in Gloucester's Westgate Street. And according to his biographer Charles Savory, he had from childhood 
more of an affection for money than for people. The house of his birth, which is now gone, was an old-fashioned, overhanging, medieval timber frame building. You can get an idea of what the place looked like by visiting the Gloucester Life Museum, which is also in Westgate Street. The house, with a shop on the ground floor, purported to be primarily a draper's and a haberdasher's. But the main operation of the premises was somewhat different. And in a little dark office in the corner of this old building, inhabited by Jemmy and two clerks, he ran a successful bank, the old Gloucester Bank, one of the oldest private banking houses in England. The scene with this dark little office sounds rather reminiscent of Scrooge's banking premises and the tank in which worked Bob Cratchit huddling over his ledger, warming his hands on a solitary candle. Such an establishment does seem rather strange to us today, a bank among the pins, needles, tapes and cotton. But the people of Gloucester had banked in this way for more than a century, for Jemmy had inherited both the haberdashery business and the bank from his grandfather James, who had founded this curious establishment in 1716. Money, of course, usually makes money. And with the resources he inherited, Jemmy also, rather shrewdly, bought an awful lot of property throughout Gloucester and in the countryside of Gloucestershire and even beyond. And by the time of his death, Jemmy was said to be worth £900,000, both in cash and in other assets, and he had a vast annual income. His wealth was such that he was said to be the richest commoner in England. He had more money than a duke. As we will see, his death and the issues surrounding his inheritance and will would prove a disaster for more than one. Banking transactions in this funny old place were made across the cloth, cotton, braid and ribbon strewn draper's counter to which Jemmy had nailed counterfeit coins that had come into his possession. A warning for the wary that this banker was no fool. Of course, he would also sell his haberdashery wares at the counter, always trying every which way to induce his customers to spend a few more pence. If a maid came in looking for a ribbon, he would usually try to sell her an extra yard, often using flattery as his means to do so, and was not against overcharging for poor quality goods. It seems odd that a man who was so rich would go to so much effort to extract a farthing from a maid, but he often repeated the adage that farthings make pennies, and pennies make shillings, and shillings make pounds. Although he served as an alderman and sheriff of Gloucester, he never had a term as mayor, and he wasn't a great benefactor to the city and its people during his lifetime. He wasn't given to public charity at all. His father, equally penny-pinching, had given him a bit of advice before he died. Don't thee leave thy money to charity. It only makes so many rogues. When someone suggested that he might found an almshouse for, for the poor with his money and that he might do some good with his wealth, he remembered his father's words and he didn't bother. And he took that as his watchword. As far as he was concerned, charity made rogues of the poor. Scrooge, of course, felt the same, though Jemmy didn't quite go as far as suggesting that the poor should die in order to decrease the surplus population. When not in his office or at the counter, Jemmy Wood would stand at the door of his house on Westgate Street smoking his long clay pipe watching the well go by and waiting for the money to pour in. He did not expend much money on himself or on his clothing. At his death, his clothes were said to be worth a paltry five pounds and he was always shabbily and rather oddly dressed. He would stand there in an old pair of breeches and hose with his hands in his tattered waistcoat pockets. His ragged clothing and his long beak-like nose made him look like a ruffled old bird, 
and his face was set in a rigid countenance, except, we are told, occasionally relaxing into a hard smile at some passerby or child who he hoped might come into his shop and from whom he might extract an extra farthing. There is a wonderful story about Jemmy Wood getting into a public carriage to London and one of the fellow travellers, a gentleman, being appalled at the condition of his ragged clothing. Jemmy didn't get angry but played the man, as his biography puts it, betting the gentleman five pounds that when they got to London and went to the bank that he could instantly withdraw £100,000. The man, disbelieving and thinking he was on to a sure bet, was rather crestfallen when he lost, as Wood had £333,000 invested at the bank in the three and a half percents. Despite his great wealth, he didn't keep his own carriage and was often too tight-fisted to hire one, and on one occasion he hitched a ride in a funeral hearse. As it started to pour with rain, he lay himself down inside the hearse with the door ajar, stipulating to the undertaker that he was to be set down just outside Gloucester so nobody could see him. But the driver, just for a bit of fun, knowing who he was, drove Jemmy into the city and set him down right outside his own house in Westgate Street for all to see. There's also a wonderful story of a visitor from London uh, going to the old Gloucester Bank to change a Bank of England £10 note into pound notes. Jemmy, miscounting, mistakenly gave him £11 notes instead. Having later discovered the mistake, this honest visitor returned to Jemmy's bank and informed the miser of his error. But before he could finish his sentence, with Jemmy assuming that he'd underpaid the man, Jemmy rather adamantly stated that no mistake was ever made and that in any case the man himself was responsible for checking errors before he left the establishment. The man, I assume with rather some glee, put Jemmy out of his misery. For once in his miserly life, he was the loser. From the account in the biography, it seems that this approach to such a matter was well rehearsed. Jemmy was known to charge obscene and usurious rates of interest for loans and mortgages taken out at his bank, but to pay rather modest rates of interest for deposits, and no interest at all if you withdrew your money a day before a year had expired. People put up with this sharp banking practice as the bank was such a solid establishment and was unlikely to fail. And there was always the danger that uh, provincial banks like this would fail. It was also not an uncommon occurrence for the bank to be closed when a customer wanted to take out their money, but to be miraculously open when someone wanted to make a deposit. In the story of A Christmas Carol, Scrooge has his poor clerk, Bob Cratchit, who is rather afraid of his master. But Jemmy had a clerk who was not in any respect like Cratchit, a man called Jacob Osborne, who he relied upon, who was not averse to speaking his mind to his master. He was constantly telling his master to tidy himself up and buy a new suit of clothes, which, of course, Jemmy ignored. He also seemed to rather despair at his master's sharp practices and penny-pinching ways. Jemmy was a man of robust health throughout his life, and even in his last illness, the miser of Gloucester carried on with business, only being forced eventually to his bed, where he died at the age of 80 in 1836 and was buried in the family vault in St Mary de Crypt Church in Gloucester, rather unloved and the last of his line. After his death, all hell breaks loose. Jemmy had no living relatives and naturally people were anxious as to what would become of his great fortune. He leaves a will in which his then £900,000 fortune was to be shared equally between four beneficiaries. Sir Matthew Wood, John Chadbourne, who was his solicitor, 
Jacob Osborne, his very tolerant and long-suffering old clerk, and John S. Sermon. These men were also his executors. Sir Matthew Wood was no relative, a former Lord Mayor of London and a radical MP, the chief supporter of the benighted Queen Caroline. Jemmy seems to have struck up a relationship with him simply because they shared the same surname. It was a relationship of mutual convenience. Jemmy allowed Sir Matthew to use his property in London and his unused Gloucestershire country estate, uh, Haverley House, and Sir Matthew helped Jemmy with business in Parliament. He was even trying to get Jemmy a baronetcy. In the modern world, such behaviour would be considered sleaze, but not back in the 19th century. It was just good business. Now, problems arise with Jemmy's will when a damaged, half-burnt codicil is found among his papers. In this, Jemmy seemingly, and really rather out of character, bequeaths money to the city of Gloucester and to other beneficiaries and charitable causes. The discovery of this document results in a long, complex and drawn-out court case. After three years in the courts, the initial judgment in the matter finds that the original will was a fraud and that it had been cooked up by the four beneficiaries. Poor old John Chadbourne, the lawyer, hanged himself, presumably out of a sense of guilt for making a mess of what should have been a simple probate matter. Two years later, that judgment was then overturned on appeal and what was left of Jemmy's estate that hadn't been eaten up with seven years of lawyer's fees, it was still a good sum, came to the uh, beneficiaries. This long, drawn-out and complex wrangling over this miser's hoard and the tragic death of the lawyer may well have been avoided if Jemmy Wood had been more amenable in life and had adopted as Ebenezer Scrooge did in the end, a degree of liberality and openness to others. I hope you've enjoyed this video and many thanks for watching. If you enjoy my YouTube channel, please do take the time to like or to share or subscribe. And if you press the bell button, you'll be given a notification every time there's new content. If you feel able to support the channel financially, you can do that via PayPal or the website Buy Me A Coffee. Any donations I receive there will be put to good use upgrading my equipment and helping me improve the quality of the video content I offer. Thanks very much indeed for all of your help.